Where did the road go? Off-road edition. Welcome to this off-road edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I'm here with Saxon and Christopher Ernst. Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about one uh, particular article that I think is really interesting. Before we do that, uh, you know, we did the two shows on the balloons there, and uh, someone sent me an article that says the U.S. Air Force may have shot down an amateur radio Pico balloon over Canada. Bastard. So I don't know if that's <laughs> if anything more has come of that, but um, yeah, it sounds like I mean they they've pretty much all the balloon stuff has disappeared from the news. Yeah, it's just the, gone. The only thing I have seen, and, and this should also be telling too, was a picture from uh, the cockpit of the U two that was doing a reconnaissance around the first balloon. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it, it it looks neat. Uh, you can see the shadow of the plane on the balloon and some of the cockpit where the guy's kind of looking out at it. But yeah. but here's the thing, you know, that was released by um, I, I forget which part of the, the government put it out, but the government put it out. They haven't put out pictures of the other ones. <laughs> right. Right. You know, so it's like, oh, it, we shot down a hobbyist balloon. We're just going to not comment on that again. Maybe people <laughs> yeah. will forget about it. And, and, and not to get political, but because this happens on both sides of the political spectrum. But I noticed that, like, people who don't like Biden were like. Oh, why is he letting the you know China fly balloons over our airspace? And then when he shot it down, they're like, "Why is he wasting this money shooting down balloons over our airspace?" Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know you can't win in those situations. Yeah, I yeah. mean, when uh, people talked about it going over uh, the you know three of them went over during the previous administration. You know, uh, you and I we've all talked on the show about how you really don't have to shoot these things right, down, right, um, right? So somewhere there, there's uh, the optics of. You know, people don't understand that, so we shoot it down to make sure they know it's taken care of. Uh, but then you get into other issues of, yeah, like you spend all this money to shoot down a stupid balloon, right? Um, and, and that's just the reactionary nature of, of every, yeah, of everything, <laughs> our it, society. Yeah. And that's why I say it's not not one political side or the other. Both sides do it. Like the the guy you don't like cannot do anything right. Right, right. And, and that was yeah, it. Pretty so, much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, why do you let it fly over? Well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And yeah. they knew it, and they knew about it. That was the other thing that yeah. came out. That they they yeah. were tracking it for a while. Yeah. So I mean, and the the fact that it blew up in the news like that to me come still comes across as suspicious, especially with the train derailment. Someone had pointed out there's over a thousand train derailments a year in the U.S., which is scary, really, when you think about it. I don't know if that oh, number. Terrifying. Yeah, I don't know if that number is true because that would mean you know a few a day. Yeah. But um, yeah. even if there's you know, a fraction of that number, that's a lot of train derailments. It's just the reason the one in Ohio is so bad is because of the really lethal stuff that came spewing yeah, out of it. The final chloride yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, people, yeah. and they're telling people in New, in my state, in New, upstate New York, to, you know, if you smell anything weird, let us know. Apparently, yeah. people are really starting to smell it in the Hudson Valley. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. And Oof. they're 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 trying to say nope, that's not that's not from the Ohio train derailment, but it's a sweet smell, which is exactly I think it's, they said sweet whatever yeah. it was. It matched the smell that people were picking up in the Ohio derailment. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you know, th- it, when something like this happens, it really does make me think uh, back on you know cattle mutes and Roswell and stuff that was going on around these nuclear sites, and if you know a lot of this wasn't covering up you know really bad stuff happening yeah. because of nuclear yeah. tests um as has been you know as has been put forth by several people but you know if you think about like what was going on and like the uh what was it is it the marshall islands the the french oh or is yeah it french yeah you know, polynesia or like just you know all of the nuclear testing that was going on in all of these you know not just in the u.s but all over um yeah, yeah. well you know so with you know, the, the nuclear testing you had like tritium blowing around everywhere um, yeah, which if you ingest it, like it's going to kill you. Um, yeah. uh, but if you don't ingest it, it doesn't bother you at all. It's, it's inert yeah. and safe. It's weird yeah. how it, it, uh, affects the biology of the body. Yeah. And you know, the thing with the, the train derailments, I kind of like look at that, like bad car crashes and things like that too. Like mm. what, what constitutes a derailment for one thing? Right. Uh, what's the, the typical payload when these things happen? Um, you know, the stuff I saw in the vinyl chloride, uh, was like orders of magnitude greater than the previous spill in Jersey when this had happened. Yes. Um, but you know, I still don't necessarily have all the points of reference on that either. Um, but it, it is, what it that is, means. it is starting to make the news a little bit more. And the EPA, I think today just said that, uh, we're recording this on the 23rd, 
of February. Um, I think today they said that the company who owned the, the stuff is going to have to pay to get it cleaned up. I saw that as well. Now, yes. what that really means and how much they'll actually pay, like, are they only going to clean it up? As, I'm sure they're mm -hmm. only going to clean it up as much as they absolutely have to. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. But the long term effects of this, I mean, we just don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we don't. And it's scary. Uh, you know, it, these are the things that show up in people's health 10 and 20 years from now. Exactly. When they start developing different types of cancer. And you, yep. you don't know until it happens. Yep. yep. And, and someone on my friend's list who lived there uh, said that he did not see the stay inside warnings and, and jogged over to his recording studio. Oh, gosh. Oh. And is now having some very serious health consequences from it because he just kept getting oh, sicker God. and sicker. And they're yeah. telling him it could be three to four months before he'll yeah. he'll start recovering from it. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I, I, I really wish they had made more of a point of saying stay inside, you know, because he just yeah. didn't know. Well, you know, the, the hard thing with everything, any type of environmental accident like this. You know, it's always downplayed yeah. initially, yeah. like we got it under control. Everything's fine. Whether or not it is. Yes. And yes. you don't find out until after the fact. Um, if you remember when the, the Fukushima Daiichi, you know, near meltdown happened. Right. Uh, there would be people out front, you know, all their suits like, oh, this is all that's happened. It's fine. It's under control. And, uh, you know, people I knew that were overseas in Japan doing uh, uh, like work for their Ph.D. and stuff were sending me notes like this is what they always say. Yeah. That means it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm thinking about getting the heck out of here. I'm concerned. <laughs> So uh, the other article I wanted to cover here real quick, kind of in, in maybe a little bit of a tribute to uh, Walt Thornhill, who passed away, mm. uh, coming off of Motherboard, yeah, right. uh, truly bizarre, scientists discover ancient galaxies that should not exist. Yeah. Um, I think I spat out my coffee, said the scientist uh, leading the team that discovered the galaxies, which should be impossible with current, impossible with current physics. Scientists have discovered six galaxies in the early universe that are so incomprehensively massive that they pose a challenge to our basic understanding of the cosmos, reports a new study. The primordial <laughs> galaxies existed just 500 to 700 million years after the Big Bang, yet they have masses that approach 100 billion times that of the sun, making them almost as hefty as the modern Milky Way. It's not clear how these galaxies were able to grow into such enormous behemoths over such a short time, of time period suggesting that our main framework for the understanding of the universe, known as the ACDM model, may be, quote, incomplete. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the first thing that that sounds to me like is the stuff that I'm familiar with through a certain Vedic cosmologies uh, of, you know, these infinite sort of infinite chains of universes mm. that essentially like it's there's no real there's no real beginning or, or end. end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what the electric universe suggests that there's no yeah. no beginning or end and they, you know, but this is the thing like Walt Thornhill would point out that every single time we look out into space and look for confirmation of things like the Big Bang theory, yeah. we're surprised and we're like, well that's impossible. Now we got to figure yeah. out how to work that in. Yeah. Instead of saying, well maybe we need to look at other models. There are some people who are looking at other models. Yeah. I was uh, reading, uh, is, is it Arthur C. Clarke? I think it's Arthur C. Clarke's uh, Rendezvous with Rama. Because yep. I've uh -huh, never read uh -huh. it, and it got referenced somewhere, and I'm like, I've never read that. I should, I, that should be my next fiction book to read. So what I found interesting about it is that they're in this in this future time period, they're, the Big Bang model is no longer the dominant model. It's like the steady state is. But there are some, yeah. some people still defending the, the Big Bang. There's, you know, and I'm going, wow, that's actually pretty prescient of him. Yeah, it is, which is not not uncommon with Arthur C. Clarke either. Yeah. True, true. But it's just like, wow, okay, so all the way back when he wrote this guy, I don't remember when he wrote it, probably early, late 60s, early 70s, maybe maybe here he is discussing that maybe the big bang theory could be overturned right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed listening to uh, where you put those episodes with Wall back together, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, just listening to him talk about the way physics tends to operate and things like that, where it's all just kind of like numbers painted over no other numbers yeah. made to yeah. fit together. And, uh, mm. you know, I've always kind of had that suspicion, but hearing that again is powerful. You're like, yeah, you know, we think we know things, but I think we're pretty arrogant about that. <laughs> yes. I really appreciate it hearing, you know, hearing, uh, I didn't listen to the recap, but I, lis I had listened to some of those back when, you know, you had done them originally. And 
I mean, you sought out other stuff. And I think one of the things that I really appreciated about Walt Thornhill is that, I mean, I honestly have a little bit of a hard time getting my head around the whole electric universe theory because it's a lot of different intersecting theories. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and he does. But I think he does a really he always did a really good job of explaining it. And, you know, that was he was sort of the person that I I appreciated how he spoke about it because it was put forth in a way that made me see those connections and you can understand it. Yeah. yeah. I, I really like that. Cause I, I agree with you. It, it's when he would talk about it, it, it fits together very well. And, and I do love his like slightly like just exasperated with life. Kind of tone. Right? <laughs> and I, I mean that as a, an endearing trait of like, you know, someone who's had to advocate for this over and over and over. Yeah. And yeah, Nobody listened. Yeah. And, he, and he is a uh, he's a physicist. He's not just some guy. Right, um, right. And a lot of people involved in the electric universe, uh, you know, who are, who support the theory are cosmologists and, and, and uh, physicists. It's not it's not like, oh, these random people who just believe this. It's people who know what they're talking about. And what I found so interesting about it was that it's I mean, what they're basically saying, the simplest way of saying it is that they're saying that electricity is a major force in the universe and it's part yeah. of what holds galaxies and stuff together. Yeah. It's not gravity. It's electric. It's electrical. It's an electrical current that is connecting these things. And that's why they stay in systems and they re can reproduce this behavior in the laboratory on a small scale. Yeah. So once you do that, you no longer need dark matter, dark energy, all this other stuff. And then it starts bringing other things into question. So mm -hmm. to me, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, and it is what it is, whether they're right or wrong. I mean, maybe maybe the Big Bang was it. There's also cosmology, you know, ancient cosmologies that talk about that, like the whole Brahmin year or whatever, where it, uh, whatever, how long that's supposed to be, where the universe yeah, expands. Yeah, the, the and year then, of Brahma and the idea of Mahapralaya. But the thing about that is, is that it's not that it's necessarily, it's more like uh, the idea of the universe kind of uh, withdrawing into itself. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a single point. Like the idea of a single point actually probably has more of, uh, I think I would say an analogy to the idea of the ohm point, which is the, uh, essentially like it is the point from which vibration started the physical world. Mm, uh, but this okay. is, it's, it's different, I think, than, um, uh, yeah, at least in my understanding of it. Uh, but again, I, I might not be understanding it correctly, but you're right. I mean, there are, I think there are, uh, it, it's this, uh, it, it's, I think it's that there is perhaps when you were looking at the larger cosmology of the universe, there perhaps could be, you know, these combinations or like overlapping systems that we're seeing. It's almost kind of like, you know, it's like the elephant uh, uh, analogy in the blind men. Yes. You know, we're seeing certain parts of it and we think it's something, but we can't see the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept and I think it needs to be taken more seriously. Yeah. And most of the reason it's not is because it was Emmanuel, Emmanuel Velikovsky right. that presented these ideas initially, uh, talking about Venus being a comet, and his stuff was so against uh, the mainstream that he was yeah. blackballed, he was attacked. He, I mean, there are whole character assassinations done on him. Uh, Carl Sagan did numerous attacks on him, uh, and it turns out that everything Velikovsky said uh, in his, his initial books, the stuff that we know now uh, has all been right, mm -hmm. and mainstream science was wrong about all of it. And yeah. yet, you can't say the name Velikovsky. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's like forbidden, kind, yeah. of, mm -hmm. kind, kind, kind mm -hmm. of like Graham Hancock. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it, whether, I, don't, I don't think it helps that Worlds in Collision was published like... Uh, I mean, he still, he was, uh, he, he went, got, came from Moscow State University, didn't Velikovsky? I don't remember. I think he did. Probably. And I, I, I can't imagine that some sort of Cold War, I mean, amongst all the other things were involved in, you know, his, you know, being stifled. Well, he also wasn't a physicist. He was a, right. um, what was he, a psychologist maybe or something like that? So they were like, you know, this isn't your field. And he was using old accounts in the Bible and stuff yeah. to support yeah. his, you know, and they're like, well, that's not a yeah. historical document. But he yeah. was finding corollaries in other ancient cultures as well that supported the same thing about Venus being a comet. Uh, yeah. Early on, yeah. so mm -hmm. Laird Scranton has a great book about it called "The Velikovsky Heresies." So you know what? I've got that somewhere. I that is a great book. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Laird Scranton's got some really. I mean, talk about somebody who knows 
how to apply, uh, you know, Vedic uh, cosmology. He's yes. really, yeah. he's got, he's got his finger on, uh, I think, you know, a pretty interesting pulse uh, of what might be happening in terms of a big picture. A really interesting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, that, that I guess is it. Unless either of you have anything else you want to add. I'm great. Balloons. Balloons. <laughs> <sighs> no more balloons. They're all gone. No more balloons. Balloon go bye bye. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>